Good to hear this morning, and those of you online joining us. So answer in your mind, not out loud, please. What makes good preaching? Well, first of all, I think you'd agree it has to be, it absolutely has to be centered on the Word of God. 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So we know good preaching uh, has to be centered on the word of God. Second, I think you'd agree that the preaching of the word of God should be preached with passion. Uh, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his classic book, Preaching and Preachers, uh, refers to it as zeal, and then he goes on to explain what zeal is. When I say zeal, I mean that a preacher must always convey the impression that he himself has been gripped by what he is saying. If he has not been gripped, nobody else will be. That is absolutely Essential. I used to think of it like this. Now, remember, for those of you that are visiting, I've, I've been here five and a half years. Before that, I was there in a pew for 30-some years. And so I, always, I heard a lot of preaching. And I always thought the best preaching was when the preacher took his heart and set it on the pulpit. But I got to thinking about that this week. And I recently actually changed my mind this week. The best preaching is not when the preacher takes his heart and puts it on the pulpit. It's when he takes God's heart and puts it on the pulpit. Amen. And I don't know that I've done a very good job of that. And so I, I'm, God's been working, me, working on me uh, about that. But to put God's heart on the pulpit, we need to know God's heart, right? And I'm thankful that in this book, we not only have the mind of God, but we have the heart of God. And we, we need uh, God, God's heart. God's desire is that he wants your heart and he wants my heart. God wants our heart. We saw a couple weeks ago in the life of, of Martha uh, that we can be cumbered about much serving. We can be careful and troubled about many things. And we can lose our joy in serving Christ. Uh, she even went so far as to wrongly accuse Jesus that you don't care and proceeded to tell him what to do. And so we can fall into that trap that uh, Martha did. But then we saw the heart of God through Jesus. And Jesus gently comes to Martha and rebukes her and says, you are anxious, you're troubled. Uh, Mary chose the good part, and that's to sit at my feet and learn of me. Last week, we looked at the life of Elijah, and we saw in Elijah's life that we can get discouraged while serving God. Even after seeing God do great things, uh, we can feel alone and begin to question whether what we are doing is doing any good, and then we can wonder if there's anybody else besides us uh, serving God. Uh, like Elijah, we can be slow to get our eyes off of ourselves and back onto God. But once again, we saw the heart of God. God comes to Elijah. God gives Elijah rest. God gives Elijah food. God gives Elijah encouragement and says, no, you're not the only one. There are 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee. And then he gives him work to do. Get up, get going, get back at it. But then in, in the most important thing, I believe from that, uh, that passage is that God brings him, sends him on a journey to meet with God and learn a very important lesson. And that lesson that, that Elijah, Elijah was about big. Elijah was about fireworks. Elijah was about calling fire from heaven. And God took Elijah aside and showed him and taught him 
God's not just in the great winds. God is not just in the earthquakes. God is not just in the fire. He speaks to us oftentimes through a still, small voice. And we need to be still in order to hear that voice. This morning we're going to continue on with uh, this theme of God's desire for our heart. Uh, these messages are probably more for me than they are for you. Uh, talking on Sunday or Wednesday after church, and, and some people are softer hearted than others. I'm, I'm hard hearted. I'm a slow learner. I'm not very emotional. I'm boom, boom, boom. I made a great military man. I'm duty driven. I'm by the book. But God has been working on me about my heart, and I'm going to be sharing those things with you uh, unless God leads differently. But take your Bibles, turn to Psalm 63. If you're using a pew Bible, it's uh, page 452. Psalm 63, of course, right in the middle of your Bibles. Psalm 63, we have here a Psalm of David. And David, those of you who are familiar with him, was a man after God's own heart. And he was, in this Psalm, he was inspired by God to share his heart. And from David's heart, we can see what God desires in our heart. Let's open a prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to be in your house this morning. Uh, we thank you for your precious word, and we thank you, Lord, that you not only show us uh, your mind, uh, you not only declare your thoughts, uh, you not only give us doctrine, which is important, uh, but we also see your heart. We see your desire uh, for us. And uh, Lord, we, we just thank you for the blessing it is to have your word in our hands. And Lord, I pray that we would not just be uh, interested in things we can learn in our minds, but that we would want to hear from you, that we would want uh, the depths of our heart spoken to uh, from you, and that we would hear and that we would obey. And so Lord, I just pray that you would help us to uh, set aside the cares and the plans of the afternoon and maybe even the week and just uh, focus on you, and the uh, Lord, that we would uh, hear, not just with our ears, but with our hearts, and obey accordingly. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Psalm is short. I'm going to read the whole thing. Uh, I'm not going to preach on the whole thing. But uh, please follow along. Psalm 63, beginning with verse 1. O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me, but those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword, they shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory, but the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. In the way of uh, background, my, my guess is that some of you uh, have study Bibles that maybe give a title uh, to this psalm. If you have a title, it probably reads something like this. A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Anybody have that? You have that in your Bible? Okay, a number of you. You have that uh, heading. So when... Uh, the Bible gives two instances, two circumstances where this possibly would have occurred. One is before he was king, uh, and you don't need to turn there, but 1 Samuel 23, uh, we, we have the account of where David is fleeing from Saul. Saul is chasing him. He's hounding him like a dog. Follow him all over the country. 
uh, 1 Samuel 23, verse 14, and Saul sought him every day. But God delivered him not into his hands. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. Uh, this is probably not the situation that David found himself in for the very simple reason, verse 11, but the king, uh, David was king when he wrote this psalm. And so more than likely, the circumstance was not when he was fleeing Saul, but when he was fleeing his own son, his own son Absalom, led a, a revolt against him to take over the kingdom. And so he flees Jerusalem, he flees the comfort of the palace, he flees the city that he had largely built, he left behind the Ark of God and was now in a desert place. Most certainly felt disgraced that his own son would do this to him, felt rejected by people who had sided with Absalom against him when he had faithfully served them so long. And then there was the uncertainty of what the future held. And so David, under these circumstances, wrote this psalm. Spurgeon aptly put it like this, there was no desert in his heart, though there was a desert all around him. And so with that as a background, I want to consider first, number one, the declaration. The declaration. O oh God, thou art my God. What a powerful statement. Six short, simple words. The longest word, four letters, and you could easily switch thou to you. O oh God, you are my God. But what is it that makes this statement, this declaration so powerful. First, letter A on your outline, it was prayerful. Do, you, do we usually say, oh God, when we pray? A lot of times we don't. We say, Father. We say, Father God. We say, Heavenly Father. We say, Gracious Heavenly Father. But a lot of, most times we do not say, oh God. We don't, we don't do that. It's probably, sadly, used more irreverently. Think of Facebook, OMG, right? Uh, it's probably used more irreverently than it is in a prayer. But when it is used in a prayer, I think you'd agree it is from the depths of the person's soul to start out, oh God. David did that here. And it's certainly a reflection of his of anguish of heart and probably desperation. Uh, he was, the situation he was in certainly would have made him feel desperate, if, if not at least earnest. And, and we'll see as we go through this psalm, or what we read already, actually, you'll, you'll see that there are, are words that really reflect uh, David's earnestness, thirsteth and longeth and followeth hard. So, oh God is not out of place in this psalm. But what's interesting in this prayer is if you, you really study it, David doesn't ask for anything. David doesn't ask for anything in this prayer. Instead, he expresses his desire to seek God. Verse 1, and to see God, verse 2, and to praise God, verse 3, and that he is satisfied in God, verse 5, and that he meditates upon God, verse 6, and he rejoices in God, verse 7, and he follows hard after God, in verse 8. So it is not so much a petition as it is a declaration and a plan of here is what I am going to do, God, but it's certainly was prayerful. Let her be. It was about the present. Oh God, thou art. You are right now 
my God. It doesn't say, oh God, you were my God, like some people, if they were honest, would say. And it doesn't say, oh God, someday you will be my God, those with good intentions. Uh, to David, it was a present reality that God was his. It was a declaration of the present. Not of good intentions, not of past time. It was a declaration of the present. So it was prayerful, uh, declaration and present, but it was also personal. Letter C. O oh God, thou art my God. Oftentimes in the Bible, the Old Testament, we'll read the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Or we'll read the God of our fathers, referring to their ancestors. And sometimes one person in the Bible will be talking to another person and say, The Lord, your God. But David doesn't use any of those phrases. David says, Thou art my God. How can that be? How can David declare that the creator and the sustainer of the universe, the sovereign ruler and the judge of all of mankind, how could he say that God was his? Many of you could give the answer, right? The answer is God becomes ours when we become his. Isn't that right? God becomes ours when we become his. And we become his when we come to God's way, the only way he allows, and that's through his son. Jesus Christ, Jesus saith unto him, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 1, 12, also have that one on your outline. But as many as received him, Jesus, to them, those that received Jesus, gave he power or the right, the authority, the privilege to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We can, God can become ours when we become his. And what a wonderful privilege that we can know that. We can have that. It was a personal declaration. <laughs> David possessed God. Do you? Are you God's? Is he yours? God has one way for that to happen. That's through Christ. Do you have Christ. Lastly, letter D, it was a probing question. It was a searching question. I say that for two reasons. So point number one there, because it requires honesty. Think about what's happening here. David is talking to God about his relationship with God. That takes honesty, doesn't it? Can one person lie to another person about their relationship with God? They certainly can. Many do. They tell their friends. They tell their spouses. They tell their pastor, I have a relationship with God. And you wonder. But you know what? God doesn't wonder. God knows. 2 Timothy 2.19, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And so David is declaring to the only being who can confirm the truthfulness of his statement when he says, Oh God, you are my God. You are my possession. On your outline, Matthew chapter 7. Notice Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I, Jesus, profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What is Jesus saying? A lot, but Jesus is saying the same thing I just said. There are pretenders. There are those that say they belong to him and are not. And Jesus is also saying, I know who the pretenders are. And so it is a very 
probing thing for David to say, O oh God, you, thou art my God. It would be a probing thing for us to say as well. There's a second reason it's probing, searching, is because it requires humility. So point number two, it requires humility. When you declare that God is your God, you are admitting, you are expressing your own personal neediness. We have, we, we have a very alive and well religion in the land right now. It is called humanism, and people are their own God. But when we say, you are my God, we are saying, I need a comforter, and I need a counselor, and I need a father, and I need a guide, and I need a protector, and I need a provider. And that takes humility. That's, that's foreign to our sin nature. It's wise and it's true, but it still takes humility for us to acknowledge that we need God. But it's also a declaration that we are willing to surrender or to submit certain things to him. When we claim God as God, it is not just what you can give to me, God. It is what we in turn should be giving back to him. There should be allegiance. There should be love. There should be loyalty. There should be praise. There should be service. And yet, I think if we really got it, the way David got it, we would not look at serving God or rendering praise to God or, or rendering loyalty and allegiance to him. I don't think we'd look at those as something burdensome. We wouldn't look at those as surrender. They would be the natural, really, uh, outworking of what is in our heart. First John, Apostle John put it like this, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. They're not burdensome. They do not cause us grief. And so David, with honesty and humility, declared, O oh God, you, thou art my God. What about you? What about me? God desires that this expression from David's heart also be in our heart. This is not just a, uh, oh, that's nice information. This is, God wants to see this in our heart as well. Let's consider next, number two on your outline, the decision. The decision, verse one again, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. David follows up his declaration that God is his with the decision to seek God. But why would he seek something he already had? Why would he seek something he already had? For the same reason, we continue to cultivate relationships with the people we love and the people we know. Men do not, or should not, uh, pursue a woman with the goal of just tying the knot. Just tying the knot is not the end point. That's the start point. That is the start point. It is, the desire is not just to tie the knot, it is to marry her and be with her and have a partner for life. People who desire a child do not desire a child just to have the child and say, look, I had a child. No, they want to raise that child and love that child and train and teach and have that child be a lifelong friend. Not when they're kids. You're the boss, okay? But as you get older. Uh, but that's also... And it shouldn't be hard for us to figure out that that's the way God wants it as well. We don't seek him 
find him once, and then are done. He wants us to have a relationship with him that grows. Uh, you know, we, we forget the personality of God sometimes, but God wants us to have a relationship with him just like he does um, with any other person that we can have a relationship with. And we can do that. He wants us to seek him. He wants us to foster. He wants us to cultivate that relationship. And we can not only have that now, but it has obviously benefits that extend into eternity. Letter A, notice the priority in seeking. The priority in seeking. Again, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. Does that mean early in the day? Yes, but not only early in the day. The time of day that you spend with God is not nearly as important as where your heart and your mind are when you spend time with God. If your mind is still in bed, then wait till you wake up. If your mind is already at work, then wait till you come home from work. Have a time that is undistracted and that is devoted uh, to him. Does early will I seek thee mean early in life? As in, don't wait till you're old? Yes, but again, not only early in life. Seeking God should be our, our lifetime passion. As a deer panteth for the water, so my soul thirsteth after thee. But many commentators suggest that the word early here uh, really doesn't have anything to do with time. It is more of an earnestness. It is more of a diligence. It's more of a, a, a zeal to seek God as opposed to the time of day. But regardless of the case, it is, it's impossible to miss the priority that David had. Verse 1, my soul thirsteth, my flesh longeth. Verse 8, my soul followeth hard after thee. Let's not miss the significance of this. I gave you the background to help us think about this a little bit more. David wasn't seeking for a way to get his kingdom back. He was seeking God. David wasn't thirsting for vengeance on his enemies. He was thirsting for God. David wasn't longing for all the possessions that he left behind. He was longing for God. David wasn't following hard after plans to figure out a way to get out of this mess and fix it. He was following hard after God. It is as if David was saying, God, I want you more than my comfort and my crown and my friends and my family and my possessions and my reputation. I want you. I am seeking you. How or why could David say such a thing? Uh, we have the answer in verse number three. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. In other words, to David, having God was better, better than having anything else. Sadly, that kind of thinking is strange to us. That's extreme. That's fanatical. That's not real. We wouldn't say that, maybe, but we'd think it. And yet, let's not forget, God shows from the man after his own heart what God wants for our heart. He wants us to seek him like that. What does God see in your heart? What does God see in my heart? What does he see in our priorities, in our schedule, in our thoughts. How many times do I hear people say, but I'm so busy. <laughs> Think about David. David was a king. 
At this point, he had pressures and responsibilities that I dare say none of us have ever felt. He had problems. And yet, in the midst of those pressures and those responsibilities and those problems, he sought God. He sought God. Do we seek God? We need to make the decision, I believe, that David made to earnestly seek God. Seek God, and then I think we need to believe the promise that Jesus made to us. And that's, blessed are they, Matthew 5, 6, which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for this heart cry uh, of David, a man after your own heart. Uh, we thank you that from his heart, we see the desire that you have for our own hearts. And Lord, we, we know too often times we get distracted like Martha, and discouraged like Elijah. Uh, we can be overwhelmed with pressures and responsibilities and problems like David could have been, and yet he recognized that the way for peace, the way for direction, uh, the way for comfort and wisdom and guidance was to seek you. And Lord, I pray that you would forgive us for our uh, half-hearted seeking of you. Uh, I pray that we would be whole-hearted seekers uh, the way David was. And uh, we thank you that you suffer long with us. And Lord, I pray that we would not presume upon that, but that we would just become uh, better, uh, more zealous seekers of you. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So what would God have us do in light of his word this morning? I think God wants us to honestly answer this question. Is God our God? Is he your God? He wants to be. Uh, Tozer put it like this in pursuit of God. God waits to be wanted. Wow. God waits to be be wanted. And of course, God can only become ours if we are his and we need to come to Christ. Have you come to Christ? John 14, 6, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. A child of God. God is your God. Amen. Do you treat him like God? Do you look to him not just to meet your needs, but do you look to him to render unto him what he deserves in the way of allegiance and loyalty and love and service and praise. We're going to stand at this time. Please stand if you can. Take time to be holy. 413, Martin and Donner are going to come. 413, take time to be holy.